Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the conversation series. I'm thrilled today to have a fellow podcaster here with me. I have Matt Gilhooley here with me. He is the host, producer, and editor for the Life Shift podcast. Um, he's also an instructor for higher education, um, and he's done a lot of really cool stuff with this podcast, and um, I cannot wait to get into this with him, but I'm going to turn it over to Matt and let him introduce himself. Well, that was, I mean, you said it all. I'm Matt Gilhooley, and I, I really have started to embrace being just like this content creator for this yeah. podcast because people listening, if you don't have a podcast, it's a lot of work. It's a lot more than I originally signed up for. So first and foremost, I really am identifying as a podcaster now and just leaning into that communication. As you mentioned, I do work in a higher education space. So like my real job, you know, the one that pays the bills right now is for a higher education college here in Orlando. And I've been doing that on and off since 2008. And it allows me the time and the flexibility to really work on this podcast, which funny enough, and we'll probably get into it, came from taking a second master's degree. I just took a ah. random podcasting class. And so it allowed me to like do that and then find this podcast. And here we are yeah. years later. It seems. Can we just talk about what you did during COVID? Because I think, <laughs> I think while all of us were secluded at home, you took that to a step higher got your master's degree on top of starting this podcast and a bunch of other things like you were busy i was bored and then i was busy so it was uh i didn't know what to do with myself because i was just so used to being able to go to the gym and then go to work and do my job and interact with friends and and then it all stopped and i was like oh man well now I guess I have to do something. And so I really, at the beginning of the pandemic, I started leaning into doing a little bit more art. So I had been doing digital artwork for a while on my iPad and just kind of creating things. And through the pandemic, I think I created maybe 13 coloring books and put them on Amazon. And so they're all there. And then a kid's book and all sorts of things that went there. But then I was like, well, I'm still kind of bored. And my brain feels like perhaps it's turning to mush. Yeah. And so I got my I got my MBA in 2003, 2004. And then so it's been a long time since since I've been in a learning capacity. I've been a teacher for a while, but from on the learning side. So I did a masters of communication at university of florida which was all online pr focus and it led me to the podcast not intentionally but every semester i would choose a class that kind of frightened me a little bit or was like Love that. I, don't know if I can get an a which was always like that was like trauma-based yeah. responses of like only choosing the easy things and so this time i was like i'm going to take hard things and so Art of Podcasting was one, and I feel like I got this unique opportunity to, to research and do the things that a lot of podcasters skip. Yeah. And I think it's helped me in this journey a lot. I love that. And I want to take that class because there that doesn't seem to be a normal class that's offered everywhere, but it just like for us sitting in these seats, like we were talking about beforehand, we you you're doing a lot of things it's more work than you know it is but how to have a conversation with somebody how to like come up with questions how to work through and actually listen um i those things are all fascinating in all pieces of being a podcast host producer whatever hat you have on um, for your podcast yeah i mean i, mean, I think the most beneficial aspect of that class was really the pre-work of, you know, researching a target audience and creating an audience persona and really honing, honing in on that and like understanding that your podcast is not going to be for everyone. Yeah. So who is it for? And once you know who it's for, talk to them or craft your conversation towards the people that you know 
are interested in listening. And I think a lot of people, when they start podcasts, they, they feel that everyone's going to listen and we know that it's not so, <laughs> and we know that we're not going to be shot to the top of the charts. And so if we know that going in, we know that we should be creating a show that one resonates with us, but also, you know, like who are the people that we really want to connect with and can we create a show for them? And congratulations to you. You just recorded your hundredth episode, um, which is no small feat. Like we were just talking about it beforehand. You were, you're doing two episodes of releasing two episodes a week right now, which is <laughs> a little insanity um, to think know. about as we're, as you and I are, uh, you know, doing things ourselves, but congratulations on that hundred episodes. That's, yeah. that's an incredible thing to accomplish. Thank you. I just really, I think as we record this, I think the 85th episode is coming out tomorrow. And so, yeah, I'm pretty far ahead, which is wonderful and weird. And I keep telling people, this is like this unexpected journey of fulfillment that the smaller version of me that really was the impetus of the show, The Life Shift, I didn't I didn't know that he still needed some healing and like so in a weird way selfishly this show has been such a healing journey for me as well. I think it's amazing what each of us takes out of um creating our own podcast and being the host and sitting in these seats to your point of fulfillment I never knew that I needed this but I I graduated from college and wanted to continue learning, but not from a textbook, but from other people. So to be here and be doing this, and I, I think your episode 82, like, it's incredible to continue to learn from everybody and hear each person's story, what they've gone through in their life. And it's it's been so rewarding it's been hard, but it's been such a blessing to to have it in my to have it in my life. I agree. And and also when you think about the people that you have the opportunity to talk to, that like how am I so lucky that these people one are just willing to open up in ways that are like insanely deep and personal to me. Like who am I? And so it is, you're right. It's just, it's just a wonderful experience as much as it is a lot of work, a yeah. full-time job. Yeah. I, and I think part of me, like we were talking about part of me, the little kid inside me, whenever I get a response back of, yes, I'll come on the podcast. It is a little bit of a kind of like a pinch me surreal kind of environment. Cause I'm like, wow, somebody actually is going to come on like it's a little bit of imposter syndrome kind of kicking in too yeah at first you're just like oh gosh i need to do this person you know a good service and i think the more you do it the more that imposter syndrome kind of fades a little i don't think it goes away but i think it fades in the sense that like okay i've done this a hundred times now the hundred and first time is probably going to feel okay and it was i did that yesterday <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting feeling. Um, in the beginning for me, I was like, I've got to get whoever I can to get on. And then you kind of get that first 10 episodes and you're going over the hurdles every 10 episodes, every episode, whatever it is. Um, you learn something new every episode. You learn um, things you need to change. Um, it's, it's definitely a big learning process. Yeah. Well, it's a good one too. And there's at, at some point you're like 20 episodes later, you're like, wait, how did I get here? I was just at 50 and now I'm at a hundred. And so it just keeps the, it's a snowball effect in a good way, you know, a snowball effect of learning and growing and just becoming more comfortable. And also I've heard you say that, you know, it's just like, it's my show. I can do what I want and not feel like I need to conform to what so-and-so podcast guru says I need to do in order to have XYZ type of show. Like yeah. I can pick and choose. I can, I can make this mine. That's been, and that's also been the biggest blessing. I'll get people who ask me all the time, like, who are the people that you try to get on your show? I'm like, everybody. I'm like, everybody 
somebody may be coming and looking for someone in particular. I said, but that doesn't mean that there are going to be everybody out there coming to look for that something in particular. I was like, everybody is hungry for something, keeping the conversations open. Each person has something that they are going to teach some the listeners. So it's always, I'm like, I'm going to talk to whoever I can talk to, whoever's willing to come on. Uh, I just, to your point of conforming, like, I don't want to be just one thing for my podcast. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, it's your show. You can do whatever you want. I think there's a lot of people out there that will tell us that we have to do it a certain way. And at first that was very daunting. I think it was something like, oh, okay, I need to incorporate that. Oh, I need to incorporate that. And at some point you just kind of go, okay, but that doesn't feel right. And with my show, it's very, I would say that 90% of it is very personal, both for me and for the guest. And so if I'm trying to squeeze them into a box, it's not going to, it's not going to feel right. It's not going to come off right for the listeners. It's not going to feel right for the guests. So I, you know, yours is different. You have, you have a lot of people that are actually could probably teach the audience something in the business sense, you know, in some capacity like that. Whereas mine, I'm like, please don't like, please don't come on the show with your bullet point list of things that you go on other shows with. I, I want to know the person. I want to know the human yeah. condition. Yes. And really, because I think to your, to your same point though, like there's someone out there that can hear a sentence that one of my guests says, maybe it's not even about their story particularly, but they hear it at the right time and it changes something in them. Uh, I do want to, you know, jump into the life shift podcast. I want, I cannot set the stage even close to probably how you can in terms of how the life shift podcast came to be and um, how your trauma helped, you know, kick this off. Yeah. Well, I mean, the show started in, in the college class, but we were, I wanted to do something that felt right in my heart. And I think well, and it, it stems from when I was eight, my mom was killed in a motorcycle accident and my parents were divorced at the time. My dad lived thousands of miles away. I lived with my mom, but I was visiting my dad at the time when she did die. And at that moment in time, my life was never going to be what it was going to be. Like it, it completely shifted to something, to some new trajectory that, you know, everything was going to be different. New school, new friends, new state knew everything, new parent, really, because my dad was somewhere else and I was going to see him on holidays and, and right. summer vacations. And it was late 80s, early 90s when, well, she died in the late 80s. But growing up in that time period, a lot of people weren't talking like they do now about mental health, about grief, about helping people through these tough moments, especially kids because everyone's like, kids are resilient, kids are going to bounce back, kids will do these things. But it's not true. It's not true. We do need, we're humans as well. And we do need some conditioning. And just the people around me didn't have the tools. It just wasn't part of society. And so in that failing of grief, as I call it, for like 20 years, I always thought, do other people have these very specific moments in which their life like just was no longer the same? And so as I was thinking about what kind of podcast I wanted to make, I, I truly wanted like a grief podcast because that was like selfish of me. And I was like, well, nobody really wants to listen to just like sadness the whole time. So how can I take that? How can I take this moment and see how the before and after? And can we look back and forth of these guests and their life, what it was like before, what they've learned from that moment? Are they grateful for that moment despite the moment? You know, that's kind of how this came about. And so I see there's like two traje there's two tracks essentially for the show. There's moments like mine, which are external, out of my control, totally changed my life. A lot of my guests have those. Those are the ones I resonate with the most because that's my own personal experience. And then I also have guests who have like gone down the road of yeah. something. Yeah. And then they're like, and then something sparks within them yeah. that they choose to 
that's like their life shift moment that they choose to jump off into a different, whether that's like quitting their job and becoming a nomad or, you know, like whatever that may be, something like that. And so that's kind of how the show came about. But I always go into every conversation just listening and trying to relate my own personal experiences through the questions that I try to guide my guests on that journey of conversation. I want to I want to dig in more to um, how you started the podcast, but something that you just said right there about listening, mm. how a lot of people, I will even say myself, like I struggle in some situations of sitting and actually listening. Like there's a difference between listening and actually listening and hearing what the person is saying. And I think uh, there are instances where pe like people struggle with that quite a bit how were you always that type of listener how did you how did you become that type of listener the show the show has taught me active listening so you know when we when we when i did the class the assignment was to create two episodes they were had to be interviewed there were certain parameters we had to have questions we had to have x y and z so i did the the first two episodes but i was like if i'm going to do this i'm going to do it all so my first two episodes, I went in with questions. And what I was finding is what I had been conditioned to do all through school, all through my corporate experience, all through just working and sitting in meetings and stuff is kind of just waiting for the next silence so that I can come in with my really super impressive question or, oh, something that proves I'm really smart because that was just like performative and very societal for me and my generation growing up. And so after that second episode, I was like, I can't do this. If I'm gonna sit here and someone's gonna tell me something about some really deep, tragic, whatever part of their life, I need to listen. And as soon as I threw those away, I found that I was able and comfortable enough in which if, you know, when you're having a conversation and a question pops up and you're like, can't wait, and then the person keeps going. Yes. What I had to find comfort in is if I forgot that question, it was going to be okay because the conversation needed to go in a different direction. So the show really taught me to just like listen. And I'm surprised, I surprise myself sometimes when I go back and I listen. And I was like, wow, Matt, you really paid attention to what they said in minute two. Because you referenced it in minute 50, you know. I I have such an active mind. And so for me, it is when I am in the episodes, I'm like, listen, I'm like, focus and actually sit here. And the popping up of the questions is typically what happens to me. And so that I love that you said that because I'm sitting here. I'm like, you know what? It is OK if I don't ask that question. Uh, and so that is that is something that I always struggle with because I'm like, I always want to like jump right in. I'm like, but I have to be able to pull back and like you said, let the conversation go where it goes. Right. Because sometimes they're gonna go off and they're gonna they're gonna tell this extra story. And then your question doesn't really make sense anymore. Why are we going back to where we were when your guest has taken you to this new land in which you can explore together? And so you know, maybe it's different. I mean, it, I think it is different for a show like mine versus a show that might be more business to business or entrepreneurial in some capacity. I think that would be different. I think it would be okay to come in with questions. I think it would be okay to have a structure that's a little bit more firm compared to mine. Mine is a little bit, I have a structure, but it's a little bit looser than yep. that. Hopping back to uh, the story of, how, you know, how Life Shift came to be. Uh, when you were talking about the tracks, I, I veer towards track one. Um, and that's, that's what I relate to. I'm a, I'm a child of divorced parents. And so I can, I remember the 10 years after the divorce more than I do the 16 years growing up with my parents together. Uh, and it is, it's a very funny thing of sitting there and I'm like, I can remember some of my childhood, but I remember the last 10 years of having to work through being the kid in the middle of two parents going back and forth between the houses. I'm like, it's, it's, 
interesting what you pick up from trauma and what you what path because uh, I have a younger sister and her and I had two completely different reactions um, to what happened uh, on that day. Yeah, the tracks are. I mean, I think that's that's the beauty of storytelling, right? In the sense that you don't have to have the same exact experience as someone, but you can have the same type of trigger. Yes. Uh, maybe not like saying divorce to divorce, but maybe like divorce and something as triggering as that. And the story starts to resonate with you because you're like, oh, this person is validating how I felt. And then allowing me to be okay with the fact that when my parents got divorced, I'm hypothesizing here, but when my parents got divorced, which they did, I was mad and that's okay. And I think sometimes we are so conditioned because of social media, because of people just being uncomfortable hearing our stories yeah. that we like, you know, put frosting on the cake and just pretend everything's okay when we're human. Like we're going to be mad. We're going to be sad. We're and all of it's okay. So I, I agree with you. I think our own experiences will help us resonate more with similar things. Yes. Though the more I do this show, the more I start to connect with those other, other, that other track as well. Yeah. But it's just not as deeply just because I don't have that same Ooh, some fire exploded in my chest and I'm going to, you know, go off on this track. But now the longer I do this podcast, I can kind of start to feel that because this is the first time in my 40 something years in which there is a fire that fulfills me in a creative space, you know? And so I'm starting to get there. But before that, you know, 30 plus years of it was just trauma informed. And there, there are so many things that, come out of trauma and everybody experiences them differently, differently. Perfectionism, that trying to live up to a certain standard, whatever it may be. I, I was, I was the perfectionism and I still struggle with that today. And it's, it's hard because you still, you like, whether you work through it or not, you work through it, you still carry it with you in some sort of sense, but you have to make it manageable where it's not overpowering to you. Uh, what have there been some trauma experiences that you've heard or that people have worked through that you've resonated with from your guests? You know, my original goal, because a lot of people are like, well, how many people listen to your show? Or, you know, like, how successful is it? Or are you going to make that $21 million contract uh, on Spotify? And you're just like, no, really, uh -huh. my goal. Yeah, no, it's not happening. But really, my goal is that each episode finds the ears that needs to hear that story the most. And it's kind of just like words on paper, right? Like, I do feel that way. But I never knew it was possible. Yeah. Like, it, you, logically, it seems like it's possible, right? And but until you feel something like that, you don't know it's possible. And in February of 2023, I had a guest on not really the same story, did lose a parent early on, not really the same experience growing up after that, you know, had other traumas and those kind of things. But the things that she was saying about her teenage years and the way she would approach certain things validated my experience. And that was the first time where I was like, oh, this is possible that something someone else says will make me feel less alone in my own experiences. And so, yeah, there's, there's been those, but that there's been a few since then actually. And maybe it's cause I like kind of opened the door of that validation. I don't really know, but that was like the first experience where I was like, this is true. And also the show is meeting its goal. Like, okay, done check Mark. It's possible. So I don't know if that answers your question, but does. Not specifically, but it, yes. Getting to a little bit of a structural question for your podcast. I, when I go and approach you or other guests to come on, there's usually a specific reason for it. How do you approach your guests? How do you figure out? How do you uh, 
determine who you are wanting to talk to uh, to have on? Well, here's an answer that you probably won't like as a fellow podcaster, but I have been fortunate enough that it's been about a year since I've had to actively seek out a guest. And here's the thing, and I think it's, I think part of it is because there's, I mean, there's a lot of podcasts like mine. I'm not going to pretend that my podcast is that unique. Is that anything? I do think there is uniqueness to the fact that I am a male having deeper conversations and being vulnerable and sharing that I am broken too. Like we all are because we're just human and there are things that are not perfect despite the fact that we pretend they are. So I think there's that uniqueness. Uh, and I think that because I am able, people have told me that I create a safe space for them. I don't want to assume that I do that, but people have told me. And so I think it naturally comes across when people listen or someone has a good experience and like recommends to a friend. So that being said, when I get pitched from either an individual pitches me or you've seen probably some really terrible pitches that come across. They're like, um, do you listen or have you listened? You know, like there's a lot of those. Yeah. And so typically I have a little bit of a back and forth because if they've listened, it's clear. You can see it in the pitch. You can understand it a little bit, but I truly do want to make sure that the guest has taken the time to reflect on that moment and how that moment has really impacted their life and have, they identify like a specific, like, was it a phone call? Was it like their boss called them a name? And that was the one day that was just like done, you know, like, have they identified that? Because earlier on in my journey, like you said, you kind of just like want anyone right at, at some point yeah. but going through it. I realized that some people just aren't ready. Some people really haven't unpacked that. And so that's my due diligence of trying to make sure before I agree that they've kind of identified that. But twofold, I don't want to know anything more than that. So okay. I don't do any research. I don't want to know. Okay. And that's intentional because one goal is I want these to be candid conversations that unfold like two humans, like, you know, going back and forth and, and wherever this conversation about their life goes, it goes. But two, I think it would go back to that original thought about like active listening. Yeah. If I know too much, I think I'm going to come in with some like preconceived ideas that I might go down this road that doesn't even exist. And we might parallel the actual highway that we should be on. Yeah. You know, we might be on that side road when really the conversation should be somewhere else. So I selfishly, I do it for myself, but it works out too, because I don't have to do all <laughs> all the planning that a lot of podcasters do. And I know it sounds really like bad in a way, but it's just how I chose to do. And again, it goes kind of against the quote unquote rules that we're told you yeah. must spend 15 hours researching your guest and know their ins and outs. And for me, that would kind of ruin the conversation from my side, because I feel like I would be directing it purposely in a direction that maybe it didn't mean to go. I think it makes total sense with yours though. Like, like we've been talking about, I think with the structure that you have and the conversations you have, it makes total sense not to have a giant list of predetermined questions. Like it, that just doesn't make sense and doesn't fit your podcast and what yeah. people are listening to get out of it. I, I mean, I agree, but you know, that's my, my approach. I've, never had a guest really worry, you know, like be concerned about that. In fact, I've had people say that they want to come on and talk about this particular pivotal moment. And I understand people have lots of pivotal moments, but I want to talk about what that guest might feel as their most significant. I'm not going to tell them what their most significant one is, but I want to center it around one. And I've had people like, okay, I want to do this. And then like, we get on the call and they're like, I've been listening to some episodes and I'm wondering, I'd like to share something that I've never actually shared publicly before. So thinking in that sense, like that's a definite yes for me. Yeah. But if I was someone that had done all this research, 
about that particular thing. Shit. What do you do in that moment? You you're derailed, or you're like, no, let's go back to the original. Like, yeah. I don't want to dictate their story, and so I'm just here to facilitate the conversation and create the platform. I mean, I mean, you know, as a podcaster, how much are you really on your show? Yeah, yeah, ten percent. God, I hope so. I hope it's ten percent, right? if not less. I want to, you had touched on it just a few minutes ago about a safe space, mm. very vulnerable conversations that are happening and just want to hear how you approach creating such a safe space that, you know, when Gus do open up about their struggles and triumphs, these pivotal moments, how you create a safe space uh, so they do feel comfortable. I don't know. I really don't know. I think it I think it comes from being real. Just being a human. I think sometimes if there's a guest that feels a little like there's a little bit of a wall, like there might be something they're ready to to open up. I find if I can share some of my vulnerabilities or something that I've struggled with or relate what they're saying to oh, well when I was 8 you know, after my mom died, everyone did this for me because they thought I just needed to be happy. So they gave me food, they gave me trips, they gave me gifts, they creating that safe space where I'm like, here's my crap. You yeah. know, I am willing to listen to yours. Because we're, we're just trying to do the same thing here. We're just trying to exist on this earth and have a good experience. But we know there's bad parts. So I think it's, you know, creating the vulnerability in myself for them, but also just listening, like we were talking about earlier, just really paying attention. Because sometimes people just want to be heard, or they want to know that someone is listening, not in a vain sense, but in like, like, I'm not screaming into the void anymore, like someone actually cares and someone is actually listening. So I don't think I do it intentionally. I just, I think of the 20 years that I struggled grieving the loss of my mom and thinking like, what if someone created a space where I could have just shared without judgment that I just wasn't feeling good? Like yeah. things weren't good. Yeah. Unbeknownst to you, you have created that safe space, which I think is fantastic. Um, and I love that you went back to the act of listening. Like I just truly think it's way more important than people make it out to be, especially me. Like, it's just, I think it's constantly something that all of us need to work on and whatever. Yeah. We're in. Well, I also think that we don't, or we weren't taught to actively listen out of fear because we, if we're prepared for that silence, it's a lot easier to get through it. Right. But so we weren't like, you know, like instead of not, instead of preparing, like ju just listen and be okay with wherever it goes and be okay being wrong and be okay not knowing. Like there's a, there's a lot of things we were trained in some way that we need to let go of. And I think podcasting does that for a lot of people. It's very weird that people are very willing to be super open to a stranger on a recording. I, I say all the time, it's, it sitting in my seat the doing these recordings are very cathartic for me hmm. uh, and i i love the opportunity to because it's a i find it whether i'm having a good day bad day whatever it is i find that i do these recordings that come out feeling lighter but also like yep i'm ready to go tackle the rest of my day i feel so much better because i got to have whatever conversation that just occurred I half agree with that. I think there is there is an energy there. I learned in my process, like as early on, maybe you did this as well. I was like, oh, yeah, I was bending over backwards for people to like, oh, I'll record four episodes in a week. But for me, I found as having some empathy and some some of those tendencies, I was absorbing so much of those stories and conversations that sometimes after a recording, like I have to go lay down, I have to go 
do something to protect my own mental health to recover from that. So I've gotten to a point where at maximum, I will do two episodes a week, can't be on the same day. You know, like I've learned in this process as well, how to protect myself. Not to say that these aren't the most fulfilling things I've ever done, but also at the same time, when you're holding that space for so long, it does get heavy. And you do have to, as a podcaster, including you, protect yourself and protect everything so that you can continue doing it. But it, I think that's a learning process. I don't think you understand that going into it because it's really exciting going into it. I very young into, I was, I, I was also doing four recordings a week and I got to the point where I'm like, I get to the fourth recording. I'm like, I don't have the energy. I don't have the same excitement that I did in the first episode in the beginning of the week. It's just not there. Um, it's not as fun uh, as it was recording the first. And like you said, it was just, it was too much. It was too yeah. much to try to handle all of all of that at the same time as find other guests, edit, do all of the things that we, <laughs> we need to do. <laughs> The yeah. conversations are the best part. The other parts are the necessary evil, I guess, of podcasting. And I would say, I don't know what yours looks like, but I would say that each episode that I do, luckily, since I don't have the research component of it, are probably eight to 10 hours of work from initial contact through the promotion of said episode. And so that seems like a lot. You know, and I think that a lot of people don't realize that, but the conversations are just, you know, 50 minutes, an hour, and that's all we do. I'm pretty close. I would say eight to 10 or 10 to 12 hours. I'm I'm solid around that 10, perhaps. Yeah, and you get into a system and you figure out what works for you. And, you know, like I use the same, obviously I use the same branding on all of my social assets. And so everything that I create for myself, I also share with the guest and there's a consistency across the board. And so like you find, you find the things that work for you and you discard the things that don't work. And then you consider new things that come into the fold, yeah. but you only take the things that, that feel right. I think that's, what's nice about having your own show and having a show that's beyond 50 episodes. That's beyond 75 episodes is that you just, you know what feels right for you and that what you're willing to do or put into it. I, absolutely. And I love, uh, I love your branding too. When I see it come up on LinkedIn, I'm like, yep, it's Matt. I'm like, <laughs> the flagship podcast. All I have to see is the colors. I'm like, there's Matt. Always yeah. And I, and I also do this like pre-recording selfie thing for. I love them. <laughs> And it's just become my thing. It's always been my thing, which yeah. is funny. It, it kind of stems back to like probably mid-teens. I just like, you know, when your parents just take too many pictures and you're just like, oh, I'm so sick of these pictures. And I just look the same in everything. And so I would, or like, I look just like bored smiling. And so I would just start making the crazy matte face, which was like what it became known as. And my dad would be like, why aren't, why don't you smile in pictures? I was like, cause that's so boring. Like I'll smile for one of the pictures, but so now like every time I go to record an episode, even before we did this, I put up a picture. Uh, it's kind of, I call it my crazy Matt face. And it's, you know, it's got one of my like branded shirts that I made for my show. And I just, just something that I think people expect now. So here we go. That's that's always my favorite thing is to see what shirt you're wearing that day. Whenever you post it, that's exact. I'm like, what's what's he got on today? What what are we saying today? Well, today is let's get pivotal, uh, and so I now I've realized that I also need to be aware of the shirt that I choose, uh, based on what my guest is going to talk about. Because I also I have like most of my shirts are based on this one three star review that I got. Which okay, really about this. What really made me uh, sad at first, right? Because you're like, I just want five stars. That's and and you learn that five stars all the time is not really oh, cool. gonna look that credible for a lot of people. So I got this three star review. It said nice things. the the t The title was "It's just okay," which wasn't that nice. 
but like inside he was like you know this just wasn't for me it's good and the audio sounds good but it's just not for me but i was just like three stars what do i do so i turned it into a t-shirt so i made like three out of five stars and i and it says it's just okay and i have two versions of that shirt that i will rotate and then i have like something that's a little bit more like if it's a harder tough episode i'll use like my pivotal shirt which is you know that or radical acceptance i have that one and then i also have let's get pivotal so yeah i rotate them but the three star review got me and then i took it back i took ownership of it i love that you made like t-shirts out of it you made branding out of it which i think is phenomenal yeah it was it was it was important for me to to acknowledge it and yeah. to acknowledge it publicly it's also a vulnerability piece it's probably a protection piece as well to like if i can own it then it doesn't hurt me anymore and so and it shouldn't really hurt me because it's a it's a review that's i don't know why you would take the time to write a three-star review but it is what it is and i took it back matt my last question for you is just what inspires you well now it is the people that are willing to be so honest and open and broken and sharing the parts that we were told we weren't supposed to share. It's people like that, and they don't necessarily have to be my guests, but it's seeing the vulnerability of the human, the humans that are in my orbit it's nice to see. And I, it sounds funny to say that to be like, Oh, I can't wait to see when someone tells me they're having a bad day, or they had a really traumatic, whatever. But what's nice about it is that like, a lot more people, I think, are being more fully human, in a way, like publicly, yeah. you know, and then not hiding the parts that maybe when they grew up, we were taught, don't tell people that you failed, or don't, tell people that you're getting divorced or, you know, like all these things are part of the human condition. And so seeing more people just like spill the, spill the beans, you know, and just be like real people is truly inspiring. And I have a little bit more hope uh, that, you know, maybe I, maybe that younger version of me that was so broken fits in, you know, and so it's nice to just see that, and maybe we are getting to a space where it's okay for people to be themselves. I think going back to earlier when you were talking about train and like how we're trained, we're trained to, to just what you had just said to not show how we're really doing to kind of not show how our mental health is. And I, I think it's so important to say, hey, I'm having a bad day and I, I I don't know how to fix it right now. I don't know what to do. I'm throwing my hands up and letting go of the wheel because I just can't keep holding on as tight as I am right now. Um, wow. I think those, those moments are extremely powerful. And like you were saying, being fully human and showing that, I think yep. is extremely powerful. And I, I'm so glad that people are showing it as well. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I think, you know, it's just to, for a second, you mentioned, you know, your perfectionism that came after yeah. the divorce of your parents. I think a lot of people that have been in those circumstances have experienced that. And you think about it and we do, we did that. We became perfectionists so that people wouldn't see that we were facing those things or so that like in my case, I became a perfectionist so that I wouldn't fail, which then in my mind, my dad wouldn't abandon me because in my mind, my mom abandoned me when she died. Just, you know, I was eight. So don't really understand the the breadth of those kind of feelings. And so I think, you know, we, we, if we were to acknowledge that early on, like what would we have done? Like, it would be okay if I got a B, yeah. it would have been okay. Nobody would have died, you know, like nobody would have abandoned me. No one would have abandoned you. Like, and so I think the more that we put this out there, maybe the next generation will see, oh, like you can be flawed and you can be successful and you can be a person and do all the things that you want to do and be accepted. 
hundred percent, a hundred percent, because I, I've come to believe no matter what happens in this world, there is nobody out there who has a perfect life. There is somebody who is, you are struggling in one way or the other. And I, I hope the next generation, like you had just said, learns that it's okay that not to be perfect all the time. Um, because it's, it's hard to get, it's hard to stay, um, in that perfection bubble and trying to be that person. That's what wears you down quicker. Uh, yeah. but yeah, I, I, I so hope the next generation is, is more willing to, uh, be truly themselves and to kind of, like you had said, be truly human. I think, I think we'll get there. Yes, absolutely. Matt, I can't thank you enough for coming on here and having this conversation with me and sharing more about the Life Shift podcast and your story. Uh, if you guys do not follow Matt or listen to the Life Shift, it'll all be linked down below. So please go give him a follow and a listen. Um, and just thank you, Matt, for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me. I never pass up an opportunity to talk about it and the journey. It's like I, like we both said, you know, this podcasting journey is fulfilling in ways that you and I, we never would have expected. So yeah. thank you for the opportunity. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And as always, thank you guys for joining me and I will see you guys back here next time. Bye y'all.